Welcome to the Glenn College's Policy Brief, an informed and engaging conversation with policymakers, policy influencers, and public service professionals. My name is Trevor Brown. I'm Dean of the John Glenn College of Public Affairs, and it's my privilege to be your host in this conversation. And I'm joined today by Dr. Ned Hill. Uh, Ned is a faculty member at Ohio State University, an expert in economic policy and economic development with a joint appointment in the College of Engineering's uh, Department of City and Regional Planning and the Glenn College. Thanks for joining us today, Ned. A pleasure to be with you. Sounds like, or looks like, as I look at that big whiteboard behind you, that it's like your brain kind of expanded onto the, the whiteboard there. Oh, it's, it's, it's a, a, a guilt-inducing list. Uh, you know, Irma Bombeck said that gift, guilt is the gift that keeps on giving. That's the gift. You just turn uh, around and you get a, a present every hour. Exactly. So, so the question is, it's more coming off the board than going on. And so far, we're winning. So, that, well, so that's good. Well, hopefully this conversation isn't too much of a chore. I'm looking forward to it. So we wanted to talk with you about the state of Ohio's economy and mm -hmm. uh, our, our fiscal situation. But guess choice, you get to start just to sort of bring this down into micro scale before we get a little bigger and more abstract, pick a specific Ohio business or a community and take us through how COVID-19 has impacted their economic and financial position. Just tell us that story. Well, we, we can look, pick Columbus as well as anything else. I mean, any, any of the three C's will do, but Columbus, it, it was, you could see it and feel it. So COVID-19, affected the economy starting the end of the first week of March. Mm -hmm. um, and the event for us was when the Arnold got shut down. Yep. Uh, and that's when all of a sudden, Friday of, of that great sports festival, um, the airport was empty. Yeah. And people weren't, weren't allowed in, in, the, um, in, the sport, in the venues and the convention center that weren't competing. And all of a sudden, restaurant sales fell. Uh, and uh, social distancing, the governor brought in, uh, introduced us to social distancing as part of the Arnold. And that really was the first shock that we saw, followed a week later as um, large parts of the economy were brought to a halt. In fact, um, I think that we already knew at, at Ohio State that um, spring break was going to be a week longer at the end of the first week of, of August. I had first first week week of March, and some of one of my graduate assistants saw the price of cruises falling. Had a third week of break and took the extra week on a floating petri dish. Yeah, I'm not sure I'd want to get on a cruise right now. No, no, and and at the end of it, she's fine. So so that's all good. Um, mm -hmm. But then so so then you began to see the industry start to collapse. So tourism and travel first one to take the shot. The second one shot second one out the gate was restaurants uh, and retail, um, just just slammed right down. Uh, and then um, the we had three huge weeks of unemployment. We went from about 5,000 new filings of, uh, of new unemployment claims a week up to six digit filings. Uh, and uh, by the end of the third week of March, the state lost about 20% of its jobs. Wow compared to what took place, you know, we had some good data from May of, of, of 2019, and we got to, to be able to match up some data. I did that independently, but uh, Professor Josh Hawley did the same thing, and we, we ended up in the same place. Um, so, so you really began to see at that point, restaurants closing, um, distribution, despite the, the boost at, at Amazon and UPS, but we have a huge uh, retail distribution industry in Columbus that shut down, uh, and then the auto plants uh, began to began to close. I think that was around the twentieth. Um, the uh, Detroit headquartered companies went on shutdown first, uh, but Honda quickly followed them. And Honda's actually been there the longest. So we don't think about Columbus. Tend not think of as a manufacturing community, but um, you know our largest single employer outside of Ohio State, our largest private employer is, um, is Honda. So, so really began to, at that point, began to see and feel um, uh, the reality of the COVID-19 recession. So let's, let's thanks for, for making that very crystal clear. That's, uh, uh, that's a crater. 
go go back pre-COVID. Tell us the sure. story or, or paint us the picture of Ohio's economy um, going into COVID. What's its composition, the trajectory? Uh, were we on strong footing going in or were we slipping? What was the situation pre-COVID? Oh, the good question. I was I was um, among the grumpy economists, uh, so I did um, actually just uh, a couple of presentations just before this large event, uh, where I was using a, a traffic light to say, you know, what should the business community think about the economy? And I was flashing yellow light, mm -hmm. uh, which was caution. And the reason why I was doing that was the consumer was carrying the entire economy on their back. Um, employment was strong. We saw wage gains uh, growing with people at the low end of the income distribution or, or the wage scale, um, and the consumer was spending. But if you, if you started looking at different spots around the economy, you saw some real weakness. Um, and the ones that I saw was uh, consumer confidence at the high end of the income distribution was dropping for, the quarter, for uh, at least the three, if not four months before that. Those are rich people. Yep. Uh, we we are the second largest aircraft parts producing state in the nation. We tend not to think about that. Uh, you know, who would have thought, but with, you know, a lot of, a lot of jet engines come out of Evandale and huge parts supply, both for Airbus and Boeing come out of the state. Well, with the, with the disaster known as the 737 max, um, that engines weren't selling and uh, assembly was slowing down. So aircraft was very weak. Uh, and we also began to see, we've been seeing declines in the automobile assembly industry since a year ago, November. Uh, we're past the secular peak there. Um, and, and sales were really slowing all the way through um, the, uh, the, the last quarter of, of uh, 2019. That was concerning. We also had, I had very strong concerns about collateralized debt in the, um, uh, in, in the business finance market. So a lot of corporate lending now is collateralized the way mortgage loans were collateralized before the Great Recession. And a lot of the, those loans were getting junk status. In fact, most of the collateralized corporate debt out of Europe was, was uh, rated as junk. But, so that, that, that's serious weakness. Yeah. Well, and I, I appreciate that. It's amazing in the midst of a crisis, you immediately forget what the world was like beforehand. Um, so I, I'm glad you mentioned the 737 MAX um, uh, crisis or uh, debacle, because that sort of yep. has slipped from the collective consciousness. What about the trade war? Um, were, mm -hmm. were we in a favorable position, um, given the, the sort of the, wherever we were, you could describe where we were in that trade dispute with, with China and other countries? Uh, the trade war killed us. <laughs> it, it hurt. Now, you didn't see it in unemployment because of consumer spending. But you saw in, you saw it in our manufacturers. I, I've been processing a, a survey of 700 manufacturers that was taken from December through January, and 80% of them said they were hurt by the trade war. And, and it, it, it isn't China, it's Mexico and Canada that really are affecting Ohio. It turns out uh, that not only is our manufacturing sector affected by it, but our distribution, you can actually distribute goods into Canada more efficiently from Ohio in the Midwest than you can from Canada because of the way transportation networks are set. Fascinating. Okay, so now we're here. We're in the midst of, of COVID. Um, how, how has it impacted the economy? You started to tell that story at the beginning of how it impacted uh, Columbus. What about the state's economic uh, makeup? How did it impact the state? Well, I mean, we aren't going to have solid numbers on, on unemployment, the unemployment rate uh, for actually almost another two months. Uh, but we do have the weekly filings of unemployment claims, and we got to look behind the window to see uh, where, where the claims were by being filed by um, occupation. No big surprise, the single largest industry filing claims was food service and food prep. Uh, huge numbers. Second largest, though, was manufacturing. And 17% of GDP, 17% of, of employment, 21% of GDP in Ohio comes from manufacturing. Uh, we also then began to see a job loss, believe it or not, out of healthcare. Yeah. And that, that uh, the governor has reacted today, today is May 1st, to allowing elective surgery. But, it, but the loss of elective surgery um, and a lot of and patient visits to, to dentists and, and to docs. Um, that has had an effect on, in the healthcare industry as well. 
pause on that one because I think that's one that's worth emphasizing. I think people just assume the healthcare system right now is so active. Certainly it must be doing well financially and economically. Just explain that again. Why is it when there are so many assets going into the healthcare system right now that it's, it's suffering economically? Well, there are a couple big reasons. The first, first reason was it took a lot of money to prepare the hospitals for the COVID spike. You had emergency um, uh, new ICUs being built and stacked out quickly. Um, you also had, so, so they had expenses on, on the expense side of their balance sheets. But on the revenue side, with the loss of elective surgery and the decline in business to doctor's office, um, that is, ha has affected them negatively. In fact, it, it is amazing that the nation's largest MD staffing agency, think of temp help for doctors, filed for bankruptcy this morning. Uh, and, and we're also seeing um, rural hospitals being put in very difficult shape. Um, and in fact, um, I pay attention to some rural hospitals outside of Ohio, um, and, and there's been uptick in, in companies getting ready, uh, uh, hospitals file for bankruptcy because, they're, they aren't, because their investment status grade is so low, they can't take advantage of any of the loans coming out of the federal government. So um, what we're seeing is, is, and is just difficulty throughout the entire healthcare sector. So you, you shared a video or a slide with me that I'd like to, to share and you can kind of walk us through. Now there are some people who are listening to this um, and so you'll have to sort of do your best to, to visually describe um, what, what we're all looking at here. But uh, go ahead and, and tell us what we're, what we're looking at here and give us a picture of how, how these different sectors have been impacted. All right, so what this is, this, this graph is a graph of the percent change in gross domestic product from the last quarter of 2019, so that's uh, uh, October, November, December, to the end of the first quarter of 2020, January, February, and March. Now, the very top, let's see if, I, if my pointer go right here, this is the percent change in GDP, and GDP was off quarter to quarter by 4.8%. That's the largest single drop since the Great Depression, bigger than the Great Recession. That's Whopping big. Yeah. I think that's a technical term. Now, the problem you have with this is January and February, things were actually pretty good. Uh, and employment marks, right? So essentially, all of this drop happened in two and a half to four weeks, depending on how you count. Wow. And we know that it's going to continue into April. We threw that month, and that wasn't a lovely month. And it's going to continue for a while. So this notion that we went into this recession like the sharp side of a V is absolutely correct. But how are we going to get out of it? There was hope there was going to be the other side of the V. And that's not going to happen. Is it going to be a U, kind of a slow return? Well, I'm going to tell you it's a W, and I'll explain why. But this graph is, is, is really helpful because it shows us the contour of shock. So what you've got is uh, is personal consumption expenditure that's the, the our, our, what what the households spend is actually dropped more than gross domestic product so that's about five and a quarter percent again we were spending normally up until about March 14th so <laughs> what happened with these patterns of purchases well one thing's kind of interesting is food and beverages purchased for off 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 premises consumption and that also includes food stores that went up almost full percent. Now, but, with all this, Ned, forgive the interruption, but with all this like hoarding of, of household products like toilet paper and paper towels, et cetera, yeah. where, where does that show up in here? Is that personal consumption or, yeah. or something else? No, that's personal consumption because we bought it. We can think of them as poop, poop futures, uh, but, uh, but our inventories in our closets don't count. Right. All right. So, and, and, and actually the, the tale of toilet paper is a fascinating economic tale. And I'll get to that if you, if we have time, but the important part here is here's food service and accommodations off by almost a percent and a half. And this was early on, the closings really accelerated. So right. this is the restaurant and tourism industry, transportation services. This is uh, the park planes out at John Glenn airport. Yeah. Um, if we think, look at what happened when it came to fixed investment, um, Businesses stop buying new equipment. This is all in two and a half weeks. Yeah. Um, and, and transportation equipment, this is a sale of airplanes and rolling stock by businesses. 
So these negative numbers are quite large. And, and this is up here, clothing and footwear. This is kind of the depth of retail you're seeing. Now, so well, um, it, it's, it's positive here that I'd love for you to explain to us is for those of you listening that the one of the few areas where there was positive growth was residential sale of houses. What, explain why that's the case. Yeah, it, it takes a long time to close on a house. Uh, so these this, this is uh, these are houses that were committed to paper was committed in February, early March, maybe January. Um, all of us who bought a house realize that there's a six week to month long lag as all the paperwork takes place. So as these clothing closings took place. So part of looking forward and the reason why I, I think that this is going to be a very slow tortured recovery is that new housing sales are going to tank. Nobody wants to show wants to show a house or go through a house right now. Um, so that you aren't going to see, this is the start of spring, summer construction season. That's going to slow right down. Automobile sales are really going to depend on um, when do they get to 0% financing. The, the, the plants are closed. They're going to start opening up um, in, in mid to late May. Uh, but it, that's going to be very slow to, to pick up. Uh, the other thing is that, that the summer travel tourism season pretty much isn't going to exist. Um, so that's, that, that's, that's pretty tough stuff. And then when you go to the services side, um, education is at risk um, and, and is producing losses. Healthcare is producing losses. We haven't yet seen what's happened with the insurance industry, but I expect that to not be doing well. Um, so that means that I expect to see a pickup in the economy up to about June or July, but it's going to be very slow because of those very strong negative forces. Then what gets scary is state and local government because what's happening there is their taxes, people pay their property taxes July 1, the fiscal year starts July 1, so they need balanced budgets. They're going to be looking for the entire next fiscal year and saying, we think it's going to be really tough. Um, so you're going to see substantial cuts in state and local government spending if the feds don't step in and make up for the whole. So I, I want to pivot in a minute to the fiscal situation of uh, state and local governments. Uh, but just, you know, so many times we're listening to something and we hear about these different letters of the alphabet, the V, the W, the L. Um, so just, just so we all have it in our mind, a V would be a sharp rebound. Yeah, exactly. Go down and, and then bang, this was just a one-time shock. The L is the one we don't want, right? We come down and then we just stay low for a long, long time. Right. That, that's the Great Depression, which, which Congress luckily has put now $3 trillion in deficit spending. They're going to hit four, and that's going to prevent the L. Just so, think about it, loser. But, but then there's two other letters that we sometimes hear about, and I think you mentioned them, and I want to just have sure I understand. So the U is a slow uptick, but you keep talking about the W, and that sounds like, am I right in hearing a double dip recession? We go yeah. down, get a little bit of growth, and then we go down again before we get any kind of rise. Is that correct? And, and that, sec that second dip I expect will take place starting in well, well, it actually is going to start in June, but really accelerate July through September. Yeah. And, 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 the, and the cause of that dip is going to be layoffs in the public sector. Now, do you, you just showed a lot of data and told a story about Ohio, um, and, and you set that up to say, here, we were in a yellow light in the, the traffic signal going into this. Would we, do you expect a similar kind of shape for the nation as a whole, or is economy, uh, or sorry, is Ohio somewhat different? No, Ohio's not different. Ohio still is a, it, it, we're a little more manufacturing heavy than the rest of the nation. Yeah. Um, but manufacturing will get a small shot as um, the reshoring or of, of some small, of some health the PPE and ventilators and the restocking of the healthcare equipment will take place. But for us, the real big issue is what's going to happen in the chemicals industry, what's going to happen in automotive. And I don't see a quick return or rebound in, in the aircraft and airframe industry. So now let's, let's pivot um, to talk about the, the health of... Um, now, however, alcohol sales should do really well. Yeah, great. That's really heartening. Um, what, what about the, the balance sheet for state and local government? 
what what we're we're as you said we're at the close of this fiscal year and it and, and budgets work in such a way that we won't really see impacts for for some time as states and localities close out their books. What's the state of Ohio's balance sheet right now? Well, right now, um, thanks to Governor Kasich, and there was a lot of political controversy over this, particularly with local government. Um, you know, the state aggressively took every loose dollar it could and shoved it into the rainy day fund, the budget stabilization fund. And there's $2.7 billion in that fund, which sounds great. Uh, but we're a big state. Right. Um, and um, demands on the, public, on the public budget by this crisis are large. We're seeing there's going to be money that has to be spent in the prison system because of the, um, the, the working of the virus, the health care problem, the uh, overtime and that's being clocked up by prison guards. Uh, we're going to see um, increases in, in, in uh, Medicaid. Uh, because of the whole health care virus. And from what I'm hearing people in the healthcare field, they're actually expecting it, that uh, health outcomes are going to get tougher going forward because people have been avoiding, who have chronic disease problems, avoiding hospitals. And, and so they're going to hit the healthcare system uh, starting in a few weeks. Um, then uh, the Sales taxes are down because cars aren't selling and people aren't eating out and retail's in trouble. Uh, people are going to stop paying their rent, particularly in retail. Um, and that's going to affect state and local government. So if you think about the three legs of funding of, of state and local government, income tax and wage taxes is just under half of the state's money. Um, sales tax, the consumption tax is a little bit over, and then there's some incidental funds. So Property taxes are, are, are the biggest, are a big part along with wage taxes in Ohio. Uh, both of those are going to be down sharply. Sales tax is going to be down. So um, by law, states and localities have to have balanced budgets. The rainy day fund is, is designed to get us through a short, shallow recession. Mm -hmm. Well, this one's not shallow and it's starting to look like it's not going to be short. Um, and uh, the state actually... Um, got over-reliant on consumption taxes um, during the Kasich administration. So um, we're, the legislature say you're going to see taxes increase, good, uh, but fees are going to increase. Um, and I think that the expenditures, thinking about what the state can spend on, it's pretty limited. Uh, the state can spend, has, you know, spends a lot of what the state spending comes from the federal government. On our own, it's Medicaid, big parts, Education is a big part, and social services is the third part, yeah. and that's where that's where the cuts are going to come. So you mentioned just a moment ago that we have uh, two almost three billion dollars in the rainy day fund, and that was there for a short, shallow recession, but we got a big deep one uh, looming. Should I interpret that to mean that we shouldn't tap the rainy day fund, or um, we should? No, we're going to have to, but you delay tapping it as long as possible. Yeah, and you and you need a set of principles when you look at that. It's it's got to be spent to maintain essential state services only. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the kind of the, the helping out with things that we can't. So if we can't make a difference, we shouldn't be spending on it. Yeah. Um, so with the state should be focusing on counter cyclical spending by by helping to spend as much of the federal dollars as we can get our hands on. Um, and uh, and we're and the other thing that's going to happen is the state initially, as has already been, been, it's in the press, it's going to do some across the board cuts, but it's going to then have to get strategic on what it cuts. Um, where, would you, where would you anticipate those cuts coming? And obviously, you, you don't get to make the call, but um, as, a protect, as a professor, you get to make a prediction. Where, where would yeah, you anticipate? And luckily, I'm not in the room. Right. Um, I, I unfortunately, well, we actually wrote about this in the, in the book we published in 2017, Coping with Adversity on Regional Recession. Yeah. And in that book, we said for economic development purposes, the single most important thing to do is maintain education, training, apprenticeship programs, so that you're in strong position coming out. Yeah. Uh, unfortunately, uh, the, I think the legislature is going to see that education is one of the easiest things to cut uh, because we're going to be dealing with the plumber's helper theory of budgeting, which means I'm going to push the problem down to the next lower level of government. Mm -hmm. So the feds are pushing it on the states. The state's going to push it on counties and locals. 
Uh, so I think you're going to see um, problem, cuts in K through eight, and I unfortunately for us, um, higher ed is going to is is going to be seeing cuts. Um, and remember, early on, I talked about how recessions kind of exposed weak sectors that showed yeah. problems beforehand. And we got lots of warning signs coming out of higher ed for two years before this event happened. Um, the regional colleges were, the regional public colleges, my, my former employer at Cleveland State among them, um, were showing signs of fiscal distress. We've seen it from OU, Cleveland State, Youngstown, Kent, Akron, Miami. Um, oh, I can't leave out Wright State. Uh, and Central State, I've seen no press clippings on, so I don't know what's there. But but it says that there, there is coming into this recession, there's pain. We also know that higher ed gave up a lot of revenue in terms of ancillary revenue, sports, um, facilities rentals. Um, and so that means that they um, uh, have losses that were unexpected in the spring. There's going to be loss of revenue during the summer. Um, so it's, it's going to take genuine leadership on the part of higher ed, each institution, and also collectively as an industry, uh, to make certain that we're in strong shape coming out. Because, and, and we also have to protect things like apprenticeship programs and experiential learning, uh, because that's true economic development. So let's, uh, I want to go back to local governments just for a minute. Uh, local governments, as you said, have the, by state law, have to balance their budgets, but they have a pathway towards bankruptcy. Um, it has oh, been no, they don't. Well, talk a little bit about that, because at the federal level in, in the Senate, we've heard discussions around, um, you know, a potential additional funding coming from the federal government, and maybe it should go to states and localities, and there's the suggestion that they have the pathway to bankruptcy to restructure. Um, so talk about whether that is an option and, and if there's some difference between state and, and local in terms of the ability to access that policy choice. Sure. Um, the states and localities have, are governed by their state constitutions as, as to their ability to bankrupt. Mm -hmm. um, however, most of them, uh, because of balanced budget rules and also their debt um, rule out bankruptcy. A perfect example is Bridgeport, Connecticut, which during the good times tried bankrupting three times and the state of Connecticut wouldn't allow it to do so. Mm -hmm. The other really good example is the Commonwealth of Puerto Rico, whose electrical system has never recovered and finances hasn't recovered from the hurricane and the United States has not been allowing it to bankrupt. Mm -hmm. uh, the only recent municipality that's been allowed to bankrupt has been Detroit uh, because um, it had to do that to, to cut back on pension payments uh, that were too high. So um, because uh, general obligation debt of municipalities and the debt of states is so well favored in the credit markets, meaning it's cheaper, it's because it's seen as very low risk. If all of a sudden you allow those the states and local governments to bankrupt, um, particularly if they don't have a, a, a insurmountable overhang or structural problem, then what happens is that debt will be start treat, be treated as junk debt or as um, uh, debt of private sector businesses. Uh, that's going to increase the cost of borrowing substantially. Yeah. And um, we also have the, the, one of the credit binds that local governments in, particularly for big cities, is that almost all of them are underneath an EPA cons consent decree to clean up their stormwater and wastewater systems, and that's eating up most of their debt capacity. So you can have the Fed saying, oh, you mismanage your debt, but meanwhile, the Feds put these municipalities in this position uh, because of, of the stormwater issue. So it's, it, it, the other point, and this is a conversation I had with a, a policy person in Washington this morning, um, and it was this, this $4 trillion of new debt that's coming into the feds. And, and the reason why we get we, this money comes to the United States is that people assume globally that we aren't going to welch on our debts, and it's the only secure government debt that's globally. We're stronger than Europe, stronger than China. Well, if you want to start blowing apart that relationship, that, that sense of safety, which Andrew, Alexander Hamilton built during the Washington administration, let the states 
and, and municipalities start, start defaulting on their debt, all of a sudden you're going to find the risk premium for the federal debt start climbing. And how would we see that? Higher uh, interest rates? Higher, higher interest rates and also difficulty of floating. Now, one of the things that um, the great senator from the state of Kentucky, Senate President um, McConnell, is right about is that the ratings agencies may be giving states and municipalities a wink and a nod pass, knowing that it's difficult for them to default, uh, which means that there is a even junk municipal debt has a market. Yeah. Um, so I think coming out of this, we're gonna we're gonna find some way of trying to to there's gonna be some way of, of imposing fiscal di discipline on the debt structure, but not every state's Illinois, which has been you know, it's about as fiscally profligate as you can get. Most states are like Ohio, um, which has been, works within a, 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 a bond cap that's in the constitution and in law. But then we're watching the municipal, the municipality's ability to invest themselves being eaten up because of the EPA. So let's, let's as we bring this conversation to close, let's look forward and focus again on, on Ohio. What are our pathways out of this on the fiscal front? Where, where, where are we? Um, you've begun to describe the kinds of the cuts that we're gonna have to make, but at some point that stops and how do we reposition um, for a healthier balance sheet and a healthier economy when this finally gets us to the other side of the W? The other side of the W? Well, the first thing is gonna be a lot of what happens, and we saw this in the Great Recession, is gonna depend on the feds. It's, it, you know, large chunks of our budget and large parts of what we do on social service side is passed through by the federal government. Um, and our ability to invest in our own infrastructure, again, because that EPA preempting a lot of our capacity debt is passed through of infrastructure spending by the feds. So it's in Ohio's best interest to have a pragmatic, moderate Congress and coupled with an executive that is actually understands how to invest in the future of the country. Mm -hmm. And we've been at loggerheads. This hasn't existed since the Clinton administration. Um, I, on the state side, we're going to really have to look at the elasticity and the way in which we tax uh, because we've been sh shifting to a regressive consumption system. Um, and that's partially get over the reliance to income tax and this notion that um, we were taxing wealthy people out of the state, um, which by the way, isn't true, but that's a different argument. Um, and so we're going to have to look at that. And then also, um, I think we're going to have to, we, we have not been looking at a, a state local fiscal system. It has been a state local plumber's helper. Uh, and so, and, and again, I don't have a problem with what the uh, Kasich administration did with local government fund. Um, but at, at this point, we're going to have to start looking at, at um, some early warning signs for municipal fiscal problems in the fiscal structure. Yeah, thanks for um, packing a lot of this for us and giving us some clarity on a very, very complex set of economic and fiscal issues. It was a pleasure, um, even though the portrait and the picture behind you now is weighing on me. I hope all of those are the to-do things you have to do to get us out of this. Um, we need smart people like you coming up with uh, good solutions to well the good up. thing is if an academic says this is what i'm going to do to get us out of it they know that they're lying because it is the political system that's got to do it yep yep well ned thanks for spending time with us i hope you and your Pleasure. family are healthy and well and i'll look forward to talking to you again in a few months and we'll have a better sense of what letter of the alphabet we're looking at and love to see you hear your insights then yeah we could even do it in person i'm looking forward to that